Today's reading is from Colossians 1, 19 through 23. It's on page 143 of the Bible at your seat. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. This is the word of the Lord. For those of you who love to sing and wonder, wait a minute, is that all the singing we're doing today? One thing we like to do at our church is we love to sing, and we are going to sing after we hear from this text. So... Um, stay tuned. There's going to be more singing at the end of our time. If you're a watch looker, uh, that's okay. We're still going to try to get you out of here at the same time, but we really want to sing at the end of this passage today. Welcome. Our Lord is risen. He is risen indeed for sure. This very day presents one of the most significant differences between the faith of a Christian and all those of any other religion. There once was a slain body of our Lord placed in a tomb and that body is no longer there. It is a matter of faith for us, though it was recorded and given testimony by many historians, by those who witnessed it, who were there. We saw it foretold in scriptures. We saw it announced in scriptures. But for us, it is a matter of faith because we weren't there. We're believing the word of God and we're believing the testimony of the saints. We believe it. We celebrate that today. If you have not been able to join us over the last few weeks, we are in the middle of a series that we've titled, This I Believe. This I Believe. We're looking at one chapter, Colossians 1, and throughout this one chapter, we're launching from there and going to other texts, but in Colossians 1, so far, here's what we have confessed as a church. Week 1, we confess, this I believe, in a majestic Savior King, where we talked about how Jesus is God, that He was revealed and He came to us as God. We Looked at week number two, this I believe, that God wants me. The last week we looked at this I believe in the power of the gospel. Today I begin with really an important question, but it's a basic question. It's a question that every worshiper of God is asking in some way. Every worshiper of a God or every worshiper of the gods, whatever they think, Or for us, every worshiper that we would say, by truth, is the worshipers of the one true God, this is the question that is asked. How can God be pleased? How can God be pleased? How can a God be pleased? How can the gods be pleased? I mean, whatever it is that and however it's being asked, that's the question that humanity needs to know. All religions are asking this question. How can we please God? How can he be pleased? I remember studying in uh, the the Greek and Roman mythology. I remember hearing about that and hearing about all the different gods and hearing the disconnect that the people had with the gods and, and the concern that, oh no, we don't want to anger them. I remember hearing about the God with lightning bolt in his hand. I remember there being this, oh no, we want to make sure we please the gods. A worshiper who's Hindu said this one time, confess this. 
Worship most of the time means sacrifices to appease the anger of the gods. Hinduism means you have several gods that you worship. goes on to say, to appease the anger of the gods who are known for lashing out against sin. They will punish you if you do something wrong. The inevitability that you'll do something that angers a god is overwhelming to us. Christianity answers that question, how, do, how is God pleased differently than any other faith? I want to ask it this way today, and I want to answer it with seven points from this text. Seven? Yeah, seven. Don't worry, we'll go through them quickly. So wait, wait, preacher's only supposed to use three points and a poem. Guess what? We are wrapping it up with a poem, but it's seven points. The way we're asking it today is what brings pleasure to a sovereign and mighty God? This text gives us, as we launch in verse 19, I want to pray and then we're going to get right into it. Lord, it is my plea to you. It is my desire that this morning we know you better. That we would love you more. So do that work in our hearts, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This text gives us Part of that answer is we begin in verse 19. The first thing that we see, the first way we answer the question, what brings pleasure to a sovereign and mighty God is this. It brings pleasure to Him to be known. It pleases God to be known. Look with me in verse 19. We don't have to look far. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in in him referring to jesus it was pleasing to god to be seen and know in fullness in jesus let's think about this i mean the only true god has no desire to be a distant throne setter it is not it does not please him to spin the world into creation to get it going and go okay good luck i'm going to be up here disconnected from all of you and just wait to judge you all. That's not who God is of the Bible. Islam believes that there's this gulf between the Creator and His creatures. And it's so absolute and it's so uncrossable that the knowledge of who God is is truly impossible. A Muslim worshiper once said, We can know what He is not, and we can know His will. But he himself is always unknowable. But the scriptures lead us to believe differently than that. The scriptures point us to the one true God. It actually shows us again and again that God's desire and his pleasure is to be known. In almost every encounter with the creation story, when we see it, God sends the message, I want to be involved. I'm personally connected. I'm a part of everything that I've started and everything that I'm doing. In creation, we see that he walked in the garden. We don't see in the creation story in Genesis that when he walked in the garden with the first man and the first woman, that they were alarmed. We don't see the animals going, oh no, what's this? <laughs> this is kind of freaking us out. It was as if it were natural. That's the Creator with us. Sin came into the world, and we know that there became a fracture. There became a distortion to that. And even throughout all the covenants from that point on, from Noah, Abraham, all of them, it's God sending the message that you are mine. I am with you. I am your God. He raised up Moses. You know Moses, the story of Moses? And he's telling him, he said, I want you to go save and I want you to redeem the people out of captivity, out of slavery. I want you to lead them to the promised land. Moses' question was what? Who should I tell them is sending me? Remember God's reply? Tell them, I am is sending you. 
And throughout that whole journey in the wilderness, there is the promise that God will be with them by cloud or by fire. They created the tabernacle, which literally is God is with us, inhabiting with us. The tabernacle became too small whenever they got established. Then they built a temple. And then the temple was supposed to be where the law of the Lord was. And the law of the Lord, just so that you know, is the very words of God communicating to the people, I want you to know me. He sent prophets. He raises up priests to communicate. These are the words of the Lord. These are the precepts of God. He wants you to know Him. We fast forward all the way to what verse 19 is saying in the New Testament. When Jesus came, they said they will call Him what? Emmanuel. Which means God with us. Just to remind us from last week, or actually a few weeks ago, when we looked at Jesus and who He is, it says in verse 15 of this chapter that we're in in Colossians 1, it says that He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And it goes on talking about His worth, His majesty, His might. But verse 15, He is the image of the invisible invisible God. I want to remind you that the word image there is the word icon, which emphasizes that Jesus is the exact representation and the manifestation of God. He is the full, he is the final, and he is the complete revelation of God. He is God in human flesh so that we would know him. So Jason, we, we get it. <laughs> Move on. Well, just so that you know, if you've ever read the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation, which I encourage you to do, whether it be fast or slow, what you're going to notice is this, that God is sovereign and that He wants you to know Him. Look at Philippians 2, the Apostle, uh, the Gospel of John, Colossians, Hebrews, everywhere i want you to know me it pleases him to be a god that we know though god is mysterious he's grand he's majestic it pleases him to be known he wants you to know him he's not ever sending the message to us that i'm hiding I don't want you to figure me out. I don't want you, I want you to guess what I'm about. That is not the message of God. Which leads us to the second thing that we sing here that brings pleasure to God. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and it is through him to reconcile everything to himself. So the second thing that pleases God is it pleases God to send his son. We know the text. It's Easter. We might as well look at it. It's a glorious text. John 3, 16. We're just going to look at the first part of it because listen to it. The CSB translation, I love it. It says, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son. Let's pause. Think about this. God loved the world in this way that He sent His Son. He gave His Son. Notice that He loved to do that. He desired to do this. The act of sending Jesus His own Son was an act that was launched from His heart. He moved and He acted from a heart of pleasure and desire. He didn't look at you and go, well... (sighs) I got to do something. No, it pleased him to send his son. We sometimes think of God as, oh, poor God. Oh, no, he had to send his son. Yeah, it grieved him what happened on the cross. We'll get to that in a minute. But no, it pleased him to send his son. He loved the world, motivated out of a positive expression of pleasure. The Father's act of sending Jesus, the Son, 
was with the purpose and the drive for supreme Trinitarian pleasure. Like Jason, I don't understand what that means. Here's what it means. Yes, sending Jesus brought joy to us, but it's nothing compared to the joy it brought the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He loved this act. It pleased God for Jesus to come. Why? Leads us to the third thing that pleases God. It pleased him because Jesus came to make right our wrongs. It pleases God to make right our wrongs. Look with me in verse 20. I was pleased to have the fullness dwell in him, Jesus, and through him, Jesus, to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace. Philanthropists are generally very happy people. Philanthropists are pleased people. It pleases them to give, A, because they can give. It pleases a philanthropist to say, Look what I have. Look what I have. I can give this. I can do this. I can act. I have great pleasure in sending this on. And it pleases them that they can help someone. God is the ultimate, divine, kind, wealthy one who takes our payments that we can never pay. And says, I will fix it. When you are the one with all the resources and with all the money, it brings joy to be able to reconcile an account for someone who can never pay it. To reconcile the accounts of the ones who cannot do it must mean great pleasure for not only the one receiving the blessing, but also the one giving the blessing. Verse 20, we see this word. It is through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in there. The word reconcile means to recover or to bring back to complete state of harmony. Sin wrecked, distorted creation, and it pleases God to send his son to bring reconciliation, to fix it, to pay for it, to reconcile all of it. In Isaiah chapter 11, I just want to read these words to you. You don't have to turn there. But listen to the prophet saying, here's what Jesus is going to do. This is what eternity is going to look like. This is because God the Father is sending the Son. This is what's going to come about when the time has come. It says, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf will be together, and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young ones will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like a cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den they will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain, for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with the water. It's coming, there's coming a day when what Jesus did by coming and by dying and rising again, where everything is going to be reconciled. Right now, you might be thinking like I was thinking this morning, oh God, come quickly, because right now it just seems like the cobras are striking why? What we have promised and what we know is that it pleases God for there to be a day for all the Sri Lankans and all the Indians and all the Americans to say, you know what, you're not my enemy. We're one with Christ. It pleases God to be known. It pleases Him to be known through Jesus. It pleases Him to send His Son to make right the wrongs and therefore bring us peace. The only way for a holy God to be pleased and to deliver peace and to reconcile us is also to bring 
justice. It pleases God to bring justice. Look with me in verses 20 through 22 here in our text. Through him to reconcile by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and you're hostile in your minds expressed in your evil actions. But now he has reconciled you. How? He did it by making peace through his blood on the cross. How? By his physical body through his death. God is known for sending the Son, and He brings peace by crucifying the Son. It brings Him pleasure to bring justice. God, a benevolent giver, gave His Son, and it was bloody, and it was costly, and it was a price to justify God accepting you and accepting me into His family. I want to read to you a long text in Isaiah chapter 53, there was a day when I had left college and I was full of passion and excitement going off to seminary and, and um, I was given the special privilege of coming from a family that has several ministers in it and I was able to meet on this certain day um, before I launched into seminary, um, my uncle Henry, I'd met him before, but we were meeting on this day, we were walking through the woods out in his backyard and I was this anxious, this excited, young minister. And I wanted to ask him, what is it I need to know? Give me everything. Like, like, that's what we do, right? Young and zealous. Just give me everything. Well, my Uncle Henry stood all of about four foot ten. Or he's real short. And he's, I don't know, mom, was he like close to in his 80s at the time? I'm in my shorts, my college shirt, and he's in his overalls. We're walking through the woods, and it took him, it seemed like five minutes to answer the question, and eventually he looked up at me with tears in his eyes, and he just kind of did his hands like this. He's always messing with his hands, and he just said, never, never get past Isaiah 53. So I want to read it to you as it speaks to the judgment of God. Isaiah 53, we're going to read verse, actually start with verse 4. Because that was a long time ago and I'm 47 now, I've got to use glasses. Here's what the prophet writes about Jesus, the one to come. It says, yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God. And afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before his shears. He did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence. He had not spoken deceitfully. Verse 10. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Verse 10, Yet the Lord was pleased 
to crush him severely. Not that it brings pleasure to God to bring torment and to cause suffering of innocent people, innocent Son of God, but it brings him pleasure that the suffering and the torment was a just payment to rescue and redeem you and me. It brought, it brings God pleasure to bring justice. And the justice came through Jesus on the cross. It brings God justice to do this. And if it was just that, then it would be no hope at all. But it brings God pleasure to also conquer death and to win life. This time we go to Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, we have one of my favorite texts. In one of my favorite texts, we see that there were some guys that were on this road to this town. There were guys just like you and me. There were guys who had kind of put their hope in this idea of what Jesus was supposed to be, that he was going to be this king that was going to rescue people. And, and all of a sudden, everything changed. Like, Jesus was murdered. Like, embarrassingly murdered. People were scattered. They didn't know what to do. And then they just got word that this weird thing had happened, that he had risen again. His body was no longer there. And so they're walking to this next town, and they're talking about this with each other. And Jesus, it says, came alongside them, but they didn't know it was him because Jesus had risen from the dead. They didn't recognize that this was Jesus. I mean, think about it. It makes sense. Like, you're not even thinking that the one that you just saw murdered would be coming up beside you. He comes up beside them and he says, what are y'all talking about? What things are troubling you? And they acted like, what are you, crazy? Haven't you heard what's been going on? And that's where we'll pick it up. He said, basically, there's this, this Messiah was killed. And, and now we pick it up. We're going to pick it up with verse 22. Moreover, not only that he died, moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, this is Jesus talking, how foolish you are. Thanks, Jesus. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures again because it pleases God to be known. Verse 28, they came near the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going to go further, but they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with him. It was as he reclined at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened. They recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? The very hour they got up, they returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together who said, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Verse 36, and as they were saying these things, he himself, Jesus, stood in their midst and he said to them, peace to you. Think about this. I want you to picture with me the ecstatic pleasure of God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son in this moment. He sees these men sad and stressed, just like you. And he wants to come alongside them, just like he wants to come alongside you. And he wants to speak to you. He wants you to know him so that something comes alive in you, so that you leave that moment, go tell other people, and hear the very words of Jesus say to you, who once were terrified, once afraid, once lonely, 
hear Jesus say to you, peace to you. Before this moment, it was only terror. But because of the resurrection, peace to you. Translation, God says, I am God. I am sent to make right the wrongs. I am sent to bring justice. I am sent to give you peace. The risen King who's conquered death and life brings pleasure not just to you. He brings pleasure to Himself. These men in Luke 24 were forever changed, which leads us to the sixth thing that pleases God. It pleases God to change us for our good. Notice the text in Colossians 1. Once, verse 21, you were alienated. Once, You were hostile in your minds. Once, you expressed in your evil actions. But now, He has reconciled you with His physical body through His death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless. Your life change brings pleasure to God. He has made Himself known to you. He sent His Son bought justice, paid the justifiable price to free you. And He did it to bring Him pleasure so that you could be forever changed. It pleases Him to present you holy. I want you to think about your life before Jesus. Without Him, you're unholy. With Him, you're holy. Without Him, you're faultless. I mean, Without Him, you're full of faults. Like like that one. Without Him, you're full of faults. Think about your faults. Think about what you are without Jesus. But in Christ, slate is clean. Without Him, or let me say with Him, you're blameless. But without Jesus, taking the punishment and the blame, you are totally to blame and rightfully accused of wrong. It pleases God to remove all those things from your ledger, to pay for it. It pleases Him to change your identity forever. It pleases God to change us from unholy to holy, from full of faults to faultless. You might have entered this building this morning, this season of your life, and feeling like you were a huge disappointment. You think, well, not only have I disappointed my family, not only have I disappointed my community, I don't even want to think, Jason, about the huge disappointment that I am to God. You may be thinking that your actions and your attitude and your way of living have only done more and more to just keep you and keep the lightning bolt in God's hand ready to go at you. You need to know you're right. If it were not for Jesus. If not for Jesus, we should be terrified. But because of Jesus, we are proof that it pleases God to change us. It pleases Him to change us and to make us somebody we could never be, which leads to the final summation of all of this. That it pleases God to save us forever verse 23 we see this that verse 22 he's reconciled you he wants to present you change you verse 23 if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith not shifting away this is the hope of the gospel this easter sermon this morning could be summed up in a single statement And I know you're thinking, why didn't you do that? It could be summed up simply, it pleases God to save us. If you don't remember anything else and you're eating your ham and your salad or whatever you do on this day, you can remember this. It pleases God to save us. It pleases God to bring salvation to this home 
I know when we gather in a minute, we're going to pray, we're going to look at each other, and I get to look at everybody, and I know everybody around my table has trusted Christ as their Savior, and I could say, this brings pleasure to God. The, the food might bring pleasure to us, but this moment that we're all like looking at each other, we all have trusted Christ. The happiest person right now in this room is not me as dad and son and son-in-law and brother and brother-in-law. It's God who's pleased to save us. Our work does not impress Him. Our work does not cause the heavens to applaud. Our efforts do not hold His joy together. His joy, His pleasure is not dependent on your good behavior. No, what pleases Him is His work to save you, to redeem you, to change you, to rescue you, to pay for you. You might be thinking today, okay, preacher, it's good talk on Easter. Resurre Resurrection Sunday, I expected something like that. That's good from a preacher. You just said you're going to seminary. You've been at this a long time. You're studied. You get Colossians 1. That's good. Now I want to go, no, I want you to hear from somebody that can testify about this from our congregation. I'm going to read to you a poem, and for those of you who go to our church and you're here every week, you know I don't ever do poems. Usually, you know, pastors like to read poems at the end to kind of hook you. This is not that. Rob Chambers sent me this poem a week or so ago. I never got over it. It hit me. This, this is what we mean when I say sing like saved people. When you hear this poem, I want to encourage you to picture and visualize two things. One, I want you to imagine the joy of the one writing it. But also, I want you to imagine and picture the joy of the one who it's written about. Imagine hearing this poem, and you're the philanthropist, you're the God of all that's done all the work, you're the one that he's writing about. Imagine the joy coming to him. Here's the poem. Only He can rescue me. Only He can rescue me. I was lost and could not see that only He could rescue me. I was blind as I could be and only He could rescue me. Then He came set me free son of god alone is he only he can rescue me only he can rescue me one dark night he came to me and whispered low his love for me i was lost as i could be but by his hand he leadeth me and only he could rescue me It was by his blood he ransomed me, and only he could rescue me. And by his victory, I can see eternity that waits for me. Only he can rescue me. Only he can rescue me. Holy Spirit, speak to me now that he has ransomed me. Teach me all that I could be. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Loving Father, now I see that you gave your Son for me holy spirit whisper low jesus comes for us below only he can rescue me only he can rescue me won't you come so you can see that jesus came to rescue thee it's by his love that he sets you free Jesus came to rescue thee. Holy Spirit, take my hand and lead me to the promised land. Holy Spirit, whisper low, Jesus loves me, this I know. That, thank God, is not from some theologically in-depth, studied preacher 
That is from a man who knows what it means to be saved. My question this morning is this. That's what I believe. Is it what you believe? That it pleases God to save you? Do you believe this? Do you believe that you're saved? Do you know that you know that this Resurrection Sunday is not just a day for everybody else to sing about? That this is a day that because of your salvation pleases God? It is a special day for us. It's not a day for us to be gimmicky or perform stuff for you who's in attendance. It's a day for all of us to be habitually stunned. He rose. He won. And he's happier about it than even I am. This is a day that we celebrate what it means for God to be pleased to be known. For God to be pleased that he came to us, that he sent his son to us. That God is pleased that he made right the wrongs that we've earned. That he brought justice. That he conquered death and won our victory. And that he's changing us forever for our good. This is a day for us to sing and celebrate. Oh, it pleases God that we are saved. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I don't know what I'm most thankful for, but I know today, right now, God, I am thankful that you are even happier than me. <laughs> we grieve and I grieve with you when you see the destruction and the calamity, the promise of peace that is given but is not yet. But it brings us great joy to know that it pleases you to save. I pray that if there be anybody in this room that does not know that they're saved, that they would see you as a God, not with a lightning bolt, but with a God who's ready, just ready to bring them in. Oh God, would you do that work in their life today? And for those of us who are saved, Lord, I pray that in a minute as we stand, we will sing like saved people and we will bring, we will even further and enhance the pleasure that you have in our worship. Oh, God, help us to love you more with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Amen.